Hello, everybody. Thanks for stopping in and, and looking and watching the show and, and listening to it. This is Dave Emmons with The Strange Reality. I guess you can call the strange reality in just about everything that we we study or look at or the ancient history. It is strange to us today uh, because we don't know exactly what what history actually they say history is not what it's what we think it is uh maybe my guest uh, steve wolberg can shine a light on some of that and uh but i I'm, i've been covering like consciousness i've been covering spirituality uh so i've been doing this for the last month or so and i think i'm getting into this topic because of what's going on in this country uh this this country and the world i mean in europe and uh, australia it's crazy. We we need God and we need peace in this world. I keep saying that on my shows. And today we're going to be talking about a lot of that, that history and uh, in, in biblical history and also uh, certain lessons that we could learn from this, this guest that I'm going to have. It's, he's a, I guess, I, I, I read his, I saw all of his information. It was really hard to print off a lot of this information. He's got over 40 books. And I'm talking about Steve Wahlberg, and he's a speaker, director of the White Horse Media. If you've ever heard of that, uh, if you've had to, I've heard of it before I even seen this. But he's a Jewish Christian from Los Angeles. Pastor Steve Wahlberg is the speaker, director of White Horse Media, TV producer, radio host, seminar speaker, and author of 40 books plus books. And I've only authored four, and that's been a lot of work. I can imagine what Steve went through. He has been a guest on over 500 radio and television shows. He has also spoken by special invitation inside the Pentagon and the U.S. Senate. Steve currently lives in Priest River, Idaho. I bet that's pretty there. With his wife, Kristen, their son, Seth Michael, and their daughter, Abigail Rose. And here's more with the... Uh, with Stephen here, he, like uh, I started off, he's a director, White Horse Media, uh, Priest River, and has a, he has a, he has a host of his Voice Today radio show. That's a television broadcast, also a prolific writer and much in demand speaker. He he is an author of over forty books. We said that, and and the conducted Bible prophecy seminars throughout North America and overseas. He has been featured on three History Channel documentaries. Nostradamus Effect, Secrets of the Seven Seals, and Armageddon, and Battle Plan, Strange Rituals, Apocalypse, and, and spoken by the special invitation inside the Pentagon and U.S. Senate, as we said earlier. He currently lives in Priest River, Idaho, with his kids and his wife. And he is a director, Whitehorse uh Media. He's a director by television producer, radio host, and international seminar speaker, Steve Wahlberg, a Christian, Jewish Christian from Los Angeles. Mr. Wahlberg has earned his BA degree in theology from La Sierra College in Riverside, California, and his Master's of Divinity degree from Andrews Seminary, Barron Springs, Michigan. A prolific writer and speaker. He has, like we talked about, he has 40 books, and that, that just baffles my mind and we just went over some of the things and he's got some we got a few books i've actually printed out some ideas on on a few books i want to talk to him about and he's got some ideas here that are that are going to hit us today and uh this this is some material that's this good for covering for today people for people to kind of settle down take a look at things and have peace in their hearts mr steve our pastor steve Wahlberg. Forgive me. I I'm usually saying Mister or Doctor, but it's 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 Pastor Steve Wahlberg. Welcome to the show, Steve. Oh, thank you, Dave. Uh, people call me Pastor Steve. Okay. Steve, uh, that's fine. My kids call me Dad. Okay. So uh, you know that's quite a bio. When I when I many times when I hear my own bio being read, I think to myself, the bio is bigger than I am. Oh no, because I'm pretty down to earth person and. Oh. Uh, I also like to garden. I've got an orchard, some fruit trees, and I like to swim and things that are down to earth. So I don't, that's not all I do is write books, but I feel a, a certain calling to write. And I've been writing for, boy, it seems like almost 30 years. And I just keep writing book after book. I've got an, oh, another one you. coming out soon. And it's just uh, a gift that I feel I have. And I, I like, 
I like writing books and I like seeing the books help people. So, so you I like what I do. Yeah, you started writing when you was 10. You said 30 years. <laughs> okay. No, it wasn't. Uh, I'm 65 now. <laughs> okay. So you didn't have to say I, you don't look 65. I was going to yeah, tell you. No, well, yeah, it's I a, think it's just it's uh, God's blessing. And yeah. and most people don't say I look I look 65. Right. I, I exercise a lot. I like to swim. And as I mentioned earlier to you, I'm on my way in the morning. Heading to uh, Washington D.C. for a couple of days to do some recording on a, on a show, and they're going to put me up in a hotel, and I hope to do some swimming in the hotel and get some exercise. So, oh, there you go. <laughs> so it's yeah. not all come and go. Yeah, Pastor Steve, while you're there, could you help these politicians have some peace between them? <laughs> can you? Can and you? That's a tall request. Yeah, I, I know it I is. Right, I now. can do that. Yeah, but uh, no, tell us about the. Uh, where you're from in, in uh, Idaho. That's uh, Priest River, Idaho? Yes, Priest. Now, that's where I live. And I actually claim when people say where, when they ask me in casual conversation, where are you from? I'll say Priest River, Idaho. But originally, I am from uh, Los Angeles. I'm from the Hollywood Hills. I grew up right over the hill from the Hollywood sign in the San Fernando Valley, up in the hills, nestled in the hills of Studio City. Uh, my background is Jewish, uh, but we were very secular. It was uh, I grew up in a cultural Jewish home. There was no religion. There was no. We didn't go to the synagogue. We didn't pray. We didn't read the Bible. So I knew nothing about God or spirituality for the first twenty years of my life. Mm -hmm. And when I got into my teen years, I went to North Hollywood High School and LA Valley College. I was surrounded by the uh, the wild. The wild life of uh, North Hollywood and Hollywood, and I unfortunately got pulled into into circles, uh, peer pressure, and friends of mine that we all just moved into things that were pretty destructive. We started using drugs and going to the to the late night discos and the parties and the concerts, and uh, some of my friends overdosed on drugs and they're not alive anymore. And it could have easily happened to me. And so I was really an aimless uh, teenager that really had no direction. And when I got, when I was 19 or 20, I began to run into Christians in strange places mm -hmm. who began to talk to me about the Bible, about God. They began to plant seeds in my mind. And because I was on a destructive path, I began to feel a need for, for something that I didn't have. And eventually I picked up a Bible, started reading it for the first time. Uh, somebody gave me a book on the life of Jesus, and I read that book cover to cover, and it really touched me. It opened my, my, my heart, my eyes, and I realized that uh, Jesus was a real person, that he lived a real life 2,000 years ago. And I, I watched you know, the scenes where he healed the sick. He helped the people that were on the margin, you know, marginalized, the woman at the well, uh, he would help lepers and people that were blind and cripple and and all these stories just really they really touched my heart and I felt drawn to him. And then when I read about him suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, and I've actually been to that garden one time. I had the privilege of going to Israel in 1983 and visiting. Uh, and, and our guide said that some of these olive trees are so old they were probably here when Jesus prayed under these olive trees. Yeah, I saw that. And, yeah, so and then I I um I was just really moved by his suffering in the garden. Uh, if you've ever seen Mel Gibson's film The Passion of the Christ, I I watched that as well and then after his suffering in the garden, he uh, hung on a cross. He was crucified and the whole story just gripped me like nothing has ever gripped me before and so one day I was uh, in a dormitory room in in Northridge, California, and I got on my knees and I asked Jesus to come into my heart to forgive my sins and change my life. And uh, that was 45 years ago when I was 20. Now I'm 65. Mm -hmm. And Dave, I don't think I would still be alive if it wasn't for God's goodness and love and forgiveness and grace and that's what started me on this journey. And it's been a long journey to get to where I am right now as a married man with a, with a 20-year-old son and 16-year-old daughter 
who's uh, now they're both driving and uh, one's in college, one's getting ready for college. And my wife and I are blessed. We have a good marriage and I'm healthy. I'm happy and I'm thankful and I'm alive. And I welcome interviews where I get a chance to share my faith and talk to people and do what I can to, uh, to well, answer questions. Well, I love having you on. I mean, what an exciting guest. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, a fresh breeze for me to have you on the show. I, uh, I kind of grew up a little bit like you. I didn't have any, any church background when I, I was poor. We had 11 kids in the family. Uh, mm -hmm. We played music, seven brothers. We played music. I drank the booze a lot, but I didn't do drugs. And none of the brothers really did did drugs. We drank because that was part of the rock and roll scene when you play rock music. Uh, we did that for about 42 years. But I can feel where you're coming from. And everybody just like you, they get a start. It, they come from the bottom. And I, I, I think that's what they say. Sometimes you hit bottom, and that's when God will reach out and lift you up. And that's what it sounds like what happened to you, you know, in that. Now, you are with... The, the White Horse Media uh, Christian Ministry based in Priest River. Now, do you have a church there or some kind of a temple that you that you work at or uh, not at not at our office? Uh, we have five acres that my family purchased 15 years ago when we moved up here, and uh, on the property is our house, and there was a big pole barn. Uh, 5,500 square foot barn. And when we first moved up here, we were looking for a headquarters for Whitehorse Media. There were families that moved up from California. Our ministry was in the Fresno, Clovis, California area. So we moved up here, found this property, and it had a barn on it. And so uh, after about two years, uh, our supporters and a lot of hard workers built up the insides of this building. So now it has two floors and 19 rooms and a large studio. And I'm in our studio right now. I've got my little uh, Zoom set for interviews like this. We have another set over there. We have another set over there. We have about 11 of us that work here at the office. And, and we don't have an actual uh, church on this property. Now, my family, we go to church in Spirit Lake about a half hour from here. But, uh, you know, we have to drive to get there. And so, th but this this operation, Whitehorse Media, is basically a media ministry. Uh, we picked the name White Horse because in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, Jesus is described as returning to earth on a white horse. It's sort of the imagery of Revelation as the hero to conquer the forces of evil. So we like that uh, that chapter. We like the imagery. We like the idea of a white horse. And we added the word media because we are reaching out through Facebook, YouTube, uh, and a whole host of other social media platforms. And we do seminars. We have uh, television programs and radio programs. So that's why we call ourselves White Horse Media. And our goal is to communicate uh, Bible truth to people and help clarify biblical issues and ultimately to bring people closer to God, to give them hope and a better life, just like what happened to me when I started reading the Bible. I was just, you must be reading my mind because I was just about ready to read that about us, uh, notes on on why you call your, uh, you know, your organization White Horse Media. And you just, you just said it for me. So I can just lay this note to the side. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I can assure you, I wasn't reading your mind. I don't have that kind of. I don't have that talent. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, you know, I I'm just. Uh, I've had some questions about you. You before the show, you were asking me if some of my beliefs were in the Bible and everything. I uh, I believe in the Bible. I I I do. Uh, there's there's some questions I have about historical times and when it really did happen. Uh, you know, like the Book of Enoch. Did that happen? Uh, 3,000, 5,000 years ago, or did it happen 60,000 years ago? Uh, that's a scientific question that I, I've i had scientists on my program talk about that. But whenever it happened, it did happen. I mean, things the, the historical markers in the Bible are very, and the geographical markers in the Bible are very true. And 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 uh, so, you know, you have to take a look at that biblical history. Maybe you can add on to that. But I think what we want to do is start off, Pastor Steve, uh, where this end time delusions. Now, this might help me, you know, uh, understand something more. You have several teachings, and you go through several different types of 
of teachings and, and, and learning from from the past and the biblical thing. The rapture, the Antichrist, Israel, and the end of the world. No area of Christianity has been subject to more misguided interpretation than prophecy. Millions of Christ, uh, Christians, since we are nearing Jesus Christ's return, yet when it comes to what the majority thinks will happen during Earth's last days and what the Bible actually says will occur, the difference is seismic. Steve covers this topic with clarity and biblical accuracy. So, Pastor Steve, could you tell us a little bit about that, what all that means? Sure, yeah. And there's sometimes I say it this way, Dave, when we're dealing with uh, Bible prophecy and the end of the world and end time events and what's supposed to happen, uh, it's it's a little bit like a wheel on a bicycle that has a hub and it has many spokes. And this topic has many, many different spokes. It's uh, it's got a lot of moving parts. Mm -hmm. And so what what in our ministry, what we do uh, is we produce programs that are, uh, and I write books that are entry level, that are for those who really know nothing about this topic. And then we have uh, books and videos that go deeper. And then we have some that go even deeper. So. Uh, just to kind of give us an overview, one of my books is called Approaching Armageddon, and I think what you read, part of that ties in with this book. Right. And Approaching Armageddon, I consider this to be like Prophecy 101. It, 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 it introduces people to the Bible, to the idea of prophecy, that there are predictions uh, that were fulfilled in the past, like in the time of Jesus. He was born in Bethlehem. The prophet said he would be born in Bethlehem. Then 700, 700 years later, he was born in Bethlehem. So there's certain events that took place in the life of Jesus that we can see were predicted before they occurred, and they did occur. And then there are also predictions about things that are happening in the world today. Uh, some of the trends, the natural disasters, the, the immorality, the increase of knowledge. Uh, there's many different Bible verses. Uh, and they're all pointing toward the the grand finale when ultimately I believe Jesus is going to come back and he's going to get rid of evil. He's going to he's going to conquer uh, the forces of evil in this world. So approaching Armageddon is sort of an overview of the of the basics. Uh, I call it prophecy 101. And then you mentioned the book End Time Delusions. Uh, End Time Delusions goes deeper uh, into issues concerning, well, what is going to happen in the final days? A lot of people, Christians, believe in in what's called the rapture. You've probably heard of that, where yes. mm -hmm. uh, the idea is that Christians are just going to disappear and they're going to be whisked up to heaven uh, prior to a seven-year period of tribulation. And there are certain things that are going to happen during that period. The temple's supposed to be rebuilt. The Antichrist is supposed to come. And so what End Time Delusions does is it really looks at those different theories to see which one is really right. So it goes, it's more designed for people that are somewhat familiar with the Bible and end time issues. And then we have another little book, little pocket book. Uh, you can stick it in your front pocket or back pocket. It's called the United States in Bible prophecy. And that book builds a case that America does have a place in the book of revelation uh, and and so sometimes in my interviews, hosts will say, well, where are we in the book of Revelation? Then I have a chance to go through some of those details. So, But each of these books are different. They they cater to different audiences. And depending upon what your, your viewers and your listeners are really interested in, or, or maybe they might, this might whet their appetite to, uh, to just check it out. And so I think approaching Armageddon would be good for them. For those that are more familiar with the different conflicting views, End Time Delusions is a fantastic book for them. And those who are curious, is America in the Bible? Then the little book, The United States in Bible Prophecy, uh, builds what I believe to be a very credible case that, yes, this mighty nation is is in the last book of the Bible. Now, you, know, you alluded to a lot of the things that are happening today. We, we have a lot of, like, weather you know, crises. We have uh, political, we have, you know, geographical, uh, you know, crisis with wars and things going on. And we have people that are very unsettled. We have religion against religion. And uh, 
Are these, you, you, I think you alluded to it just a little bit a while ago, are these the signs of the end times? Or could we, a lot of people are saying this is the end, and uh, they say the Nephilim are coming back. And even Jesus uh, said that in the times of Noah, when the giants and the Nephilim were there during the flood, he said, when the end times come, you'll see the giants and Nephilim return. W what does he mean by that? And, and the end times in which what we're kind of looking at now, a lot of people are fearful of a third world war, and that could mean the end times. Uh, Pastor Steve, what can you say about what's going on? I, don't, I know it's a lot to, un to unpack. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yes. And I understand. And uh, that's why we're doing these. That's why I'm doing these interviews. Uh, I do believe we are in, in the end, in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse four, that says in the time of the end, knowledge shall be increased. And if you look at, at history, uh, really most of, of recorded human history People traveled on uh, donkeys, on camels. They walked. They got into a boat. They rode. Uh, and but within the last, you know, hundred years, uh, now we have the internet. We have satellite. We have Starlink. Our our uh, house. We're connected to Starlink. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to get on a Delta flight, and and I'll be in uh, Baltimore by the end of the day. And all of this is is really. Uh, unique to our relative modern times. Uh, and now we have, you know, Teslas and, and electric vehicles and the list just goes on AI. And so I believe that you can build a case that in Daniel chapter 12, verse four, it says in the, in the time of the end, knowledge will be increased and knowledge has exponentially uh, increased in the last 50 to 100, 200 years. So that's just one one uh, one prophecy. Now you mentioned Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, this is a sermon that Jesus gave when he was on earth. And he listed many, what we could call signs of the times. And many of those signs were happening in his day. Many of them have been going on throughout history. And we're also expecting uh, an increase of these signs as we get closer to his return. Now you mentioned uh, just a little bit like war. So let me just read this. In Matthew 24, uh, Jesus said in verse 6, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and pestilences, which means diseases, and earthquakes in various places. Uh, and then he goes on and he says in verse 12, uh, verse 11, many false prophets will arise. They will deceive many. Uh, verse 12, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. So each one of these is like a sign. Uh, he also mentioned the gospel of, of the kingdom, which is the good news of what he did for us on the cross and rose from the dead, that this is going to be preached in the whole world as a witness to all nations before the end comes. You mentioned the days of Noah. He said in verse 37, uh, as the days of Noah were, so shall it also be before the coming of the Son of Man, or as which is him. He's the Son of Man. Uh, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So we have a lot of different signs, signs in nature, like earthquakes, famines, diseases, like uh, the coronavirus. Uh, we have things going on in society where lawlessness is increasing. We have knowledge increasing. We have the gospel going out to all the world. We have parallels with the days of Noah. If you look back in Genesis, it describes what life was like in the days of Noah. It says uh, that men's uh, imaginations were corrupt. And it says the earth was full of violence. And there's a lot of, you know, there was violence back then. Jesus also said, as it was in the days of Lot, you go back to Lot's day, uh, Lot lived in Sodom and Sodom was full of, uh, you know, sexual immorality. And so I think we could just, it, it's not just one thing, Dave. I believe there's a, there's a whole cluster mm -hmm. of these things that when we look at all of them, uh, there's a lot of people in this world that are looking at what's happening in society and they are thinking to themselves, 
something unusual is happening. Uh, we're seeing an escalation of these different things. And a lot of us believe that these are signs or indicators that we're getting closer to the return of Jesus. And that's what he said, that he he went up to heaven after his resurrection, and he said, I'm going to come back again. And these things are going to happen prior to that time. So for me, as a, as a believer in the Bible, I do believe in the Bible. I know what it's done for me, what it's how it's helped my life and changed my life. It gives me, uh, it's sobering to see what's happening around the world, but it also gives me hope that uh, God understands all of this. He's not surprised by these things. And when we read the back of the book, as they say, uh, the good news is that God is going to win and love is going to win and uh, evil is going to go down and uh, God's kingdom is going to be established forever. So that's what gives me hope and courage in the midst of the challenges of this world. I have, I've got this perspective that we're not just we're not just a planet that is hurtling through space with uh, with no no guidance that where there is a God in heaven who is still in charge, mm -hmm. even though there's a lot of bad things going on, he's still in charge and he he's, he's going to win against the forces of chaos and evil at the end. That's what we're fighting now. It's, it's good against evil. And uh, this is between us humans. I, I guess the evil it is or it's, it's within humans and then the goodness is also within humans and we're fighting back and forth now when it comes to jesus coming back uh there's been a lot of people in the past i guess the i guess maybe pastors preachers they they've all said here's the day of the end times and there's been a lot of false alarms throughout the years and a lot of people, I guess, they get uh, they get a little shy about that. They say, "Oh, that's just talk." That you know, the end times, and they're not. It's not going to come. Maybe it never will come. But has academia? I know you you've dealt with a lot of it. You're you're, you're, you're a master's degree person, so you you have an academic background. How does academia? I know I've had some scientists on my show, and we talk about you know biblical history and history not being what it what we think it is. That it's it could be a little bit di bit different than what we think it is, but they're talking that academia and I guess religions, there's are they still four apart, uh, Pastor Steve, or are, are they coming together on this idea of biblical history and what's written in the Bible? Well, I don't think there. There's a lot of discussion in lots of circles, and there are many different opinions. You know, because I'm Jewish, I have a Jewish background. Uh, sometimes I, you know, I can get away with a Jewish joke, and the Jewish joke is, "What do you get when you cross two Jews?" And the answer is, you get three opinions. And so it's just a little joke, you know, kind of humorous. But and just to extrapolate on that, when it comes to academia, when it comes to scientists, uh, it's all over the board when it comes to religion. Now, it's true, like you mentioned, that there are people that have made uh, predictions that certain things weren't going to happen and at a certain year. And back to Matthew 24, you know, Jesus is pretty clear about that. Uh, as I mentioned in verse 11, he said, many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. So Jesus warned about false prophets and false teachers. And he, he said in verse, uh, let's see what verse it is, 30, 34, 35, 36, Jesus said, uh, but of that day and hour, no man knows, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. So Jesus is very clear. There's going to be false prophets. And he said, nobody knows the exact day or the hour when he's going to come back. Mm -hmm. So uh, when people make predictions, you know, it's it's a little bit like the boy who cried wolf, you know, the old story. He cried wolf so many times and he was just making it up that people in the village, they just lost interest in anything that he had to say. And when people claim to be Bible-believing Christians and they set dates, uh, what they make the rest of us look bad and they create this uh, this eventual feeling where, where people just dismiss the whole thing. Uh, and, and I don't believe, I think that's an extreme view. 
And so, and when it comes to uh, scientists and academia, but my, this is my opinion, Dave. Um, I think that people that get very educated, and I do have a bachelor's, I've got a master's, but the Lord has taught me a lot of things. I think that people who become very educated, there's a temptation. Uh, I don't think it applies to everybody, but there's a temptation for people to become uh, very sophisticated and uh, arrogant sometimes and to think they know more than they know. And then they lose the simplicity of faith in God and in his word. And so I've learned through my ups and downs uh, the Lord has never let me down, but he's knocked me down before to teach me lessons. And I think you mentioned something about the fact that when people get down to the bottom, you know, then they feel a need for God. And it's unfortunate that people have to get down to the bottom before they look up. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people who haven't been at the bottom, they, they can get uh, very sophisticated about their ideas and they get married to their own opinions and they lose the simplicity of faith. And I believe that the Bible is true. And Jesus made a statement. He said, unless we become like children, uh, we'll never enter the kingdom of God. We need to humble ourselves and become like children. And there's a big overriding theme in scripture, warning against pride and teaching humility. There's a verse that says uh, in Micah chapter, I think it's chapter seven, it says, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? So I've ex been exposed to a lot of different views in, in different universities and a lot of different uh, academic and religious views. And personally, I've learned to take those views with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have to, you know, if somebody has some real cred credible valid arguments. They need to be considered, of course. Uh, but a lot of what I think is out there, there's a lot of noise out there where people are uh, speculating and saying things that they really don't know what they're talking about. And so it's, uh, to me, you know, we've gone through the industrial age. We've gone through the different ages throughout history, the Enlightenment, the Reformation, the Industrial Age. And now I think we're in the age of confusion because we have uh, social media and we have access to so much information. It's like information overload, what we're getting on, on YouTube, social media, legacy media, alternative media. Uh, there's so much out there that we all just need to take a step back and pray that God will give us discernment to discern what's right and what's wrong and try to sort through all this. And like I said, I've been studying the Bible for 45 years and that's what my books are about. My books are designed to make things simple to help the average person understand. After I came back from the seminary, uh, I, was, I was offered a job to teach at a Christian high school. And it gave me the opportunity to teach teenagers, freshmen, sophomore, junior, senior. I was their Bible teacher. And during those days, it taught me, that experience taught me how to come down from the theological clouds uh, and to make things simple so that teenagers could understand them. And I think that's why people appreciate White Horse Media. That's why they like our, our YouTube channel and our videos and my books is because people can actually understand them and they make sense. I have a, I have a question. I guess, personally, I take a look at the Immaculate Conception you know, with the two angels and Mother Mary. And there's something supernatural. I guess you can call this thing with Jesus Christ and all the prophets, it, it's kind of supernatural in a way. But what happened between the two angels and Mother Mary? Does that make Jesus Christ a hybrid? He's he's part of uh, Mother Mary and he's part of these angels. And and what, what would you call that, uh, Pastor Steve? Well, what the Bible says is that Jesus, Jesus is the name that we give to him as a, as a human. But Jesus did not originate in Bethlehem. Uh, there's a prophecy in the book of Micah 
that talks about Bethlehem, that out of Bethlehem, and this was given 700 years before Jesus was born, that out of Bethlehem, he would come forth, who would be the ruler uh, of Israel. His goings forth have been from of old, from the days of eternity. So I believe that Jesus is the son of God and that he existed long before he was born in Bethlehem. But when he when he was born, uh, he, 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 there was an angel, a holy angel named Gabriel that was sent from God to uh, a woman named Mary who lived in a town called Nazareth. And Nazareth is there today. You can go to Nazareth. You can go to Bethlehem. I've been to both those places. And the angel appeared to Mary and told her that she was going to give birth to a, to a child. And this uh, baby was going to be the son of God. And his name was to be called Jesus. And then Mary was engaged to a man named Joseph, and she told Joseph uh, afterwards, actually uh, sometime after that, she began to show. And and then when Joseph found out that his, uh, his fiance was expecting a baby, he automatically assumed that she was unfaithful and he was going to put her away and end the, end the relationship. But he went to bed, and, and an angel appeared to him in a dream. And the angel told him, don't be afraid, Joseph, to take Mary as your wife, for what is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, Joseph, you know, woke up, and he realized that my wife was telling me, the, or my wife-to-be was telling me the truth. And so the Bible says that uh, the conception that took place inside of Mary's body was wholly supernatural. It, it says that it came from the Holy Spirit, that and it was before Mary was married to Joseph and before they had come together in sexual relationships, uh, in a sexual relationship. So Jesus is a supernatural child, and Scripture tells us that he's, he's a blend, you could say. He's a combination of, of God and man, or of, you know, participating in Mary's humanity. He's some Christians say he's the God man. He's he's a blend of both. He's a mysterious blend of both. Now, for me and for you, uh, my parents, I know my my parents, they're both dead now, but I came from my mom, who is Sandy Wahlberg, and my dad, who is uh Gene Wahlberg. Now, Jesus came from Mary, his mother, but he had no earthly father. And Joseph was not his his dad. Uh, he came from his father in heaven, and then he was supernaturally born. So this is a mystery that we call the incarnation, when 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 uh, the Son of God became a human supernaturally in Mary's womb. And so when Jesus grew up, he had there was a part of him that was uh, was divine, that was different from any other human. But there was another part of him that was very much like us, that was human. And that's where the mystery of the incarnation comes in, you know, how he can be God and man, and how could he, how, how could he uh, conquer evil? He would, the Bible says he was tempted in all points like as we are. So we get tempted in different ways, and Jesus entered humanity so he could experience our temptations, but he conquered those temptations, and that's what gives us the strength that when we have addictions and battles and character flaws and defects that we battle with, that Jesus uh, is able to help us in the midst of our humanity because he was in humanity and still is in humanity, and he defeated those things. So that's part of the mystery of Christianity. And you know, as you know, Dave, there's a lot of different religions in the world. There are yes. many different views. Uh, they're endless. But there is no other religion anywhere that teaches that God or the Son of God became a human and did it because he loves us to come down here to relate to us. And then at the end of his life, he took our shortcomings, he took our sins, he took our failures, and he paid the price for those things when he died on the cross. And then because he was innocent, he took our guilt, paid the price, and then he rose from the dead. So now he can legitimately and legally in the sight of God uh, forgive our sins and give us a new life. And so this is all part of the of the mystery of Christian. Yeah. I 
quite unique. <laughs> yeah, I uh, in my in my book, Angels and Supernatural Entities. Of course, uh, if you would have wrote the book, it would have been you know it would have been up there. But for me, it, it was a learning process to study some of these biblical verses. I, I got into studying the the ascension. He went up. Jesus went up on this mountain, small mountain, and he took uh, Peter and a couple of the disciples with him, and he he reached up to the sky, and he glowed. These disciples said that he glowed like a white, bright light, and he was, uh, I guess, ascending. And uh, they said that he also he performed other miracles, like he would disappear sometimes, just be gone, and then he'd be back. Uh, and disciples said that he he's done he done he's done miracles like that. So I guess with the power of God, I guess he would he would be able to do that. We would call it. I do a lot of studying in extraterrestrials, ETs, and I wrote a book about UFOs. I, I've seen them. I've been involved in, and and that's why I look at the Bible too as being extraterrestrial in a way. There's been ex extraterrestrials involved, and I'm trying to figure out what's the difference between, like you talk about Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and all of them who ascended, and uh, so you know, but they come back. Well, a couple of them come back, but one of them didn't. Where did they go? Or were these angels that took them? Or were these extraterrestrials in which a lot of people are starting to think, uh, Pastor Steve? Yeah, well, you, you've raised a lot of different issues. Yeah. Uh, I think you're you're kind of, first of all, you're combining a little bit. When Jesus glowed, that was when he, it's called his transfiguration, where he took Peter, James, and John up on a mountain, and they all had prayer. And then uh, Jesus was glorified in front of them where his face was shining and his clothing was like the light. Mm -hmm. And that was God's way of showing the disciples. And that was before his crucifixion. It was God's way of trying to show them that he really is my son and, uh, you know, hold on to your faith in him even when he dies on a cross. Uh, because when he died on the cross, they were devastated. But then he rose from the dead physically. They saw him resurrected. And then and then his ascension was later on. Uh, after his resurrection, 40 days later, he took his disciples up to the Mount of Olives. Uh, or no, actually, he took them to a mountain in Galilee. And that's where he was. Uh, he, he went up to heaven. Uh, actually, it was, I think it was at the Mount. He met with them in Galilee, and then he brought them back to the Mount of Olives. And then he was taken up, and they watched him go up into heaven. So that was that was his ascension. And there were angels that were there. This is in Acts chapter 1, where uh, it says that Jesus was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. That was after the resurrection. He disappeared up in heaven. And then there were two angels standing beside them in white clothes. And they said to the disciples, they said, men of Galilee, why are you standing here gazing up into the sky? And then, and then they said, the same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, he will come back again just as you saw him go, go up in heaven. So those were, I believe those were angels. Those were angelic beings. Uh, which are a different order than humans. There's human beings and there's angels. And there were there's been angels appearing all throughout the Bible. And in that situation, there were angels that were there when Jesus went up to heaven and the angel said, he's coming back again. So I believe in, in, a, in a real Jesus. He was really born in Bethlehem. He lived a holy life. He suffered in Gethsemane. He died on the cross for our sins. He rose from the dead. He went to heaven and he's actually coming back again. And I believe in, in real angels. Uh, that there are, uh, there's an invis there's a visible world and there's a invisible world, and 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 I think it's one way I th I think can people can relate to this. If we look at the visible world, we all know that there's good people and bad people. Right. We know that there are people that tell the truth and that there are people that lie. I mean, we all know we're living in a time of uh, of hackers and people trying to steal your identity, and they call you on the phone and they say, hey, we we just want to let you know there's a problem with your account, so. Uh, give us your login information and we'll fix this. Yeah. And these are these are scammers. These are liars. And so just like we can all see that in the visible world, there are humans that tell the truth. There are humans that that lie. It's the same with with the invisible world. Many people have never connected those dots, but I believe that in the invisible world, there are angels. And some of those angels are good. 
they're on God's side, and some of those angels are bad, and they are deceivers who ultimately followed Lucifer in his original rebellion in heaven, and they're now down here. So we have good people, bad people. We have good angels, bad angels. We have Jesus who went up to heaven, who's going to come back again. And uh, we're in a we're in a battle. We're in a conflict. We're in a war between the forces of good and evil, both in the visible world and in the invisible world. And that's what the Bible the Bible lifts the veil and helps us to see the this reality. Which we, if you don't really read the Bible, it's hard to grasp uh, these kind of truths. But that's one of the benefits of reading the Bible when you you know your your show is called Strange Reality and it's a strange reality that we're living in a conflict between good angels and bad angels we but that's part, that's what the Bible teaches yeah. I I actually saw Pastor Steve I actually saw an angel twice one in 1971 and one in 1998 uh, uh it was a white cloaked you know, with a veil over standing at the foot of my bed is about three o'clock in the morning, both times. And it just mm -hmm. stood there and looked at me and it, I got up and I was watching it and it walked away. And then I tried to follow it and it disappeared. Now, is that an angel or angels do come in human form in order to relate to us, right? Yes, they do. They and, do. We uh, see that in the Bible. When the, when the disciples were watching Jesus go up to heaven, uh, these angels were, were, uh, in white garments, but they were in the form of humans. They they were they took the form of of humans, and so they could relate and talk to the disciples. And so, yes, I, I believe sometimes evil angels appear as evil angels. Sometimes they can appear as humans. Good angels sometimes appear as angels. Sometimes sometimes they appear as humans. There's a verse in uh, the book of Hebrews that says, "Do not be forgetful to entertain strangers." or some have entertained angels unawares. Right. And you see this throughout Old Testament history that there were people that encountered angels, but they didn't know they were angels They could because they looked like people. They were in the form of, of humans. Right. Are we being tested, Pastor Steve, about our goodness? Jesus said, and this is, you asked me my beliefs earlier, and the things that I remember from what Jesus said is love, kindness, and forgiveness were some very key words that that he said that I I took to heart. And that's what life is all about, is love, kindness, and forgiveness. Uh, I don't think we have a whole lot of that today. But with angels, of course, I think you can see a beggar on the street, even nowadays. I mean, we're being kind of tested in a way that there were our kindness is being tested because these beggars could be angels, like you said. And it's that's it's right. and you treat everybody with kindness, and I I think that's what I've talked about on my shows before, and I've gotten into the extraterrestrial form of it. Now I, I'll only get in this just a little bit. To ask you a question about. It. I'm not going to take you off topic, but there's been a lot of sightings of UFOs, uh, UAPs in the air around the world. The Pope actually come out and said that the veil is kind of lifting right now. And he said that we will probably see more supernatural things or events or entities now. And he, and his whole committee, I guess his, his, uh, his group that he, he, he converses with or, or his, his group, his panel, whatever, they agreed that there are more supernatural things happening and just be prepared for that. And uh, so with the, uh, the two questions, I'll, I'll, you know, the, the UFOs, what are they to you and, and to the Bible? And what is this thing, what the Pope is saying about seeing supernatural things? Just those two questions. Yeah. And before, if you don't mind, before I answer that question, let me go back to your question just a couple seconds ago about being tested. Are we being tested? Mm -hmm. And the importance of love and kindness and forgiveness. And I, I, I don't want to just pass that over because it's so important what you what you what you brought up. I do believe we're being tested. Uh, if you go back in Bible history, ever since the rebellion of Lucifer in heaven, where he took a third of the angels and they came down here to this world, uh, God and God made Adam and Eve. He set up a test, and the test was two trees. There was the tree of life, which was the good tree, and then there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
and God gave them one simple test. He, and the test was, you can eat from every tree in the garden, but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because if you do, you'll die. And so that was a test of their loyalty to him. And they failed that test, and that's what brought the great controversy into human history. So now we're all in the midst of this. And all throughout history and, and through our personal lives, uh, God does test us. We are being tested. And, and my, my belief, Dave, is that, uh, you know, it's like if you're in school. My, my wife is a math teacher in a Christian high school, and, and uh, she gives tests. And I've been through many years of schooling, and I know what it's like to take tests. Mm -hmm. And when you take a test, you have to study for the test. You have to know what's going to be on the test, or you hope what's going to be on it. And it's the same way with God. God doesn't test us without letting us know what's going to be on the test. And so the, the bottom line for me, and I could show you lots of Bible verses about this, is that the Ten Commandments, which God wrote with his own finger on stone, this reflects his will, his character for humanity. And Jesus summarized the Ten Commandments in the, in the two great principles of love to God and love to your neighbor as yourself. And so we're all being tested. Our character is being tested. Are we going to lie? One of the commandments says don't lie, the ninth commandment. The eighth one says don't steal. Uh, the fifth commandment says honor your father and mother. Number six says don't steal. I know the Ten Commandments by heart because I've studied them very carefully. I've taught them to my kids. And so that's where the test comes in. Are we going to lie? Are we going to tell the truth? Are we going to you know, love our neighbor as ourself? Or are we going to selfishly take advantage of them? And that's where the testing comes in in, in humanity. Now, as far as... Um, your question about the supernatural in the book of Revelation, uh, it's very clear that as we get closer to the coming of Jesus, there is going to be many supernatural uh, manifestations in this world that are coming from the other side, that's for sure. But like I mentioned before, just like there's two kinds of people and there's two kinds of angels, the book of Revelation encourages us to discern between the source, to discern the source of those supernatural manifestations. Are they from God or are they from the other side, from the dark side? And let me just let me just read one section here uh, for you in the book of Revelation. Okay. Revelation is the last book of the Bible. And in chapter 16, in verse 14, it talks about, it says something very amazing, Dave. It says, uh, Revelation chapter 16, verse 14 says, They are the spirits of devils, and they work miracles, and they go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them together to the battle of the great day of God Almighty, which is called Armageddon in the 16th verse. So that tells us that we can expect global miraculous manifestations of of actual devils now when people see these manifestations they think wow this is wonderful and but they don't realize that there are there are evil spirits out there there are devils out there that are tricksters that are trying to lead us astray uh, and and i believe god is also going to be doing miracles too the miraculous but the miracles that god does lead us into harmony with his word, whereas the miracles that Satan does are designed to lead us away from God, away from his word. It's like in the Garden of Eden when a serpent talked, that was a uh, that was a miracle because serpents don't talk, but Satan entered the snake and spoke through the snake, and Eve thought, this is a miracle. Here's this snake carrying on a conversation with me. And so that was a, a miraculous event, but it was led by the devil to convince Eve to go against the word of God. And that's what she did. She ate the fruit, which is the opposite of what God told her. So just, just like what happened in the beginning, I think the same thing's going to be happening at the end. We're going to see manifestations, supernatural manifestations of, of both sides. And God's manifestations are designed to, to bring us to his word. Whereas Satan's is designed to lead us away from his word. And we got to keep that in mind mm -hmm. when we think about the supernatural uh, in these days and in the days ahead.
So you think UFOs are supernatural and they're coming from, I've, I've talked to a lot of scientists and, and, uh, we, we talked about that most everything is extraterrestrial because angels come in from another dimension into our dimension, ghosts or spirits in which Jesus didn't believe in. I don't think uh, that's what I read. Uh, my part of it, I maybe again, like the, uh, the Ascension, uh, you corrected me on that. There, there was a, a couple of Ascension, but I got that, said that wrong on that, on that mound. But when Jesus, when, when he was talking about all these things, he, he actually kind of come close to saying there are other worlds. Am I misinterpreting that, uh, Pastor Steve? Well, there is there is a verse. There are a number of verses. I do, and I do believe that there are other other worlds in the book of Hebrews. Let me just see if I can put my finger on that text. Uh, Hebrews chapter eleven. It's for or chapter eleven. It talks about God, and it says about Jesus, and it says through whom he made the worlds, uh, plural. I can't put my finger on that verse, but I know there is a verse that says, through whom, through Jesus, he made the world. So I don't believe this planet is the only uh, inhabited world in God's solar system. I do believe in an invisible world. I do believe in, uh, you could call them extraterrestrials, which means they're not from this world. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I see out there is, uh, I don't think there's aliens out there that are like Star Wars or, you know, these creatures that have these weird faces right. i i believe that there are good angels there are bad angels there's the holy spirit i believe that uh the evil angels can create quite quite fantastic things in order to convince people of different things now it's really interesting i've done not prop i probably haven't done as much as you dave but i've done some research into ufos and extraterrestrials and I've discovered that many of these uh, extraterrestrials actually try to communicate with people uh, through channels, through channeling, right. uh, which is very similar to what happens in, uh, in occult circles where a person will go into a trance, like in a seance, and then this ghost will speak through them and they channel these different spirits. And in the new a in the uh, UFO community, it's very similar where you have spirits. Ch they say they're aliens from other planets, other galaxies, and they channel their ideas through humans. And when you look at a lot of their teachings, it's very, uh, what should I say? It's very revealing that many of the things that they, these supposed extraterrestrials teach when they channel their ideas through humans is, is exactly what uh, Satan said in the Garden of Eden when he channeled himself through a snake. He said, uh, he said, if you eat the fruit, you won't die. And he said, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And I've looked at some of the teachings of these uh, supposed beings from other galaxies and they say the same thing that lucifer said through the serpent in the garden of eden to eve one of their one of the hallmarks of their teaching is that humans are god you are your own god and you just need to go inside and realize this and become enlightened uh, but it, it's the same teaching that came from the serpent in genesis chapter 3 and when i see the same teaching coming from supposed extraterrestrial aliens saying the same exact thing that the serpent said to Eve in the Garden of Eden, it causes my little antennas to go up. And I think, aha, uh -huh. you know, I know who you are. You're not who you say you are. You, you are a fallen angel trying to trick me. And so we need to be, we need to be on our toes and not just accept anything that comes from the other side. I, I, I've done a lot of research and, and I can't argue with you about that. There's nobody really knows, you know, the, the theories about these ETs and UFOs. I don't, you know, I've been studying them. I, I can't, I can't tell you what they are. I've seen six UFOs up close uh, and I can't really tell you what they are. I know what I've experienced, but I've never experienced anything really evil. 
Uh, so I'm lucky to be here, I guess, today, uh, uh, Pastor Steve. Let's go move on to this one thing. I think we we talked about it earlier. America in prophecy. In spite of America's declining currency and trillion-dollar deficit, what happens in Washington, D.C., and you're going to Washington, D.C., still affects the globe. Recent setbacks aside, the United States of America yet remains the world's sole superpower. Is America mentioned in Bible prophecy, or has God left left out the greatest nation on earth? And you tackled this subject, uh, Steve. So we'll stay we'll stay on topic. Uh, I promise. I got some more questions about biblical things myself, but I, sure, I'll, that's okay. I, I I can probably you know, uh, but I want to get on on some of your talking points. Could you tell us about that, Pastor Steve? The America in prophecy, and what's and it's, sure, yes. it's the timely thing. It's today. It is, and we're getting closer to an election, mm-hmm. and. A lot of people are thinking about America. The world is thinking about America. Who's going to be the president? What kind of a nation are we going to be? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And among those that are, and Dave, I don't know how up on prophecy a lot of your viewers are. Maybe they are uh, skilled in this area, maybe not. But when it comes to those who are really prophecy teachers of the book of Revelation and the Bible, the book of Daniel and Revelation, a lot of them say that the United States of America is not in the Bible. They'll say Israel is, maybe Iran or Iraq or Russia or China, uh, but America's not there. And I don't agree with that. I have done a vast amount of study on this. I have a little book I, I mentioned a little bit ago called The United States in Bible Prophecy. And basically what I do, Dave, in that book is I focus on one Bible verse in the book of Revelation. Revelation to me is an amazing book. It's the greatest book on prophecy ever written. It's been around for 2,000 years. Uh, It's been translated and retranslated all around the world. And as more and more people are thinking about uh, the end times, people are going to the book of Revelation. I don't know if you heard this or not, but uh, there's a gospel singer named John Rich. He's yeah. in Nashville. Yes. And John John Rich had had a, a what he believes to be an encounter with the Lord uh, not long ago where he said God came upon him like a sledgehammer and impressed him to write a song on the book of Revelation. And that song just flowed out of him. It took a very short time. It was written It was put on YouTube. It's got somewhere around 3 million views right now. It's just called Revelation. If people go to YouTube and type in John Rich song Revelation, they can find that song. And it's a powerful song dealing with the battle between good and evil. Mm -hmm. And in the song, he says, uh, Revelation, I can feel it coming like a dark train running. It's coming. And that song launched I was able to get get him on the Tucker Carlson show, which is a big show, mm-hmm. uh, discussing his song in the Book of Revelation. So my point is that there's a lot of people these days that are that are looking at the Book of Revelation, trying to figure it out. And this is this has been this is really my field. I have studied this book for years, and so I want to share with you just one verse mm-hmm. Good. in Revelation Good. chapter 13, verse 11. 1311, the Bible says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. Now, there's a lot in this verse. And first of all, I don't believe that uh, John just made up the book of Revelation. John, when he wrote this book, the, the book was written by John. John was one of the disciples of Jesus. When he wrote this book, he was an old man. He was in his 90s. He was a fisherman by trade. He was uh, on an island called the island of Patmos, which is there today in the in the Greek Sea. You can go there and take a tour of the island of Patmos. There's people that live there. And John wrote this book. And he wrote it, he says, because Jesus appeared to him and gave him the book. And he just, Jesus told him to write down what he saw. So he just wrote it down. He didn't make it up. He didn't, this is not a book that comes from the creative genius of a, of a fisherman, but he was just a humble man that got the book of Revelation. So he says, I saw another beast. In his vision, 
Jesus showed him a beast. Now, one question is, well, what is a beast? You know, when Barack Obama was president of the United States, he was driven around in a sleek black limousine, which they called the beast. Mm -hmm. So people thought, oh, Barack Obama's the beast because he's being driven around by the beast. But that's just, you know, specul speculative nonsense. When you when you compare scripture with scripture and look at the book of Daniel, especially Daniel 7, and compare it with Revelation 13, it's very clear in prophecy that a beast is a symbol of a nation, of a mighty nation, just like people think of the I, buffalo. I got a question, Pastor Steve. There's seven or eight beasts that they mention in the Bible. Goliath was one of them, and uh, there's other, they called them, they had names for them. There was seven of them. I, you probably know this being the man of the cloth. And I, I just know enough about the Bible to be yeah. dangerous and yeah. <laughs> confusing. But uh, I, I, there was seven beasts I mentioned. And I mentioned in, the, in my book, uh, these are the supernatural entities that I was getting to, these beasts that the Bible talked about. Pastor Steve, could you you just talked about the beasts. Uh, what yeah what are what were those beasts and what what were they right were? yeah yeah you did, when you look at revelation 13 it talks about beasts a lion a bear a leopard a dragon with 10 horns there's a beast from the sea a beast from the earth and when you compare daniel uh, revelation 13 chapter 13 with daniel chapter 7 the chapters go together like a lock and a key and in daniel 7 daniel had a dream and he dreamed of four beasts he dreamed of a lion with eagle's wings. He dreamed about a bear with three ribs in its mouth. He dreamed about a leopard that had four heads and four wings. And then he dreamed about a dragon-like beast with 10 horns. And in Daniel chapter 7, verse 23, an angel came into Daniel's dream and explained to him, this is what he said. He said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. And Daniel was living in Babylon. And the winged lion was a symbol of ancient Babylon. Archaeologists have uncovered winged lions uh, representing Babylon. So when you look at Daniel 7, in its context, the lion was Babylon, the great Babylonian nation ruled by King Nebuchadnezzar. The bear was the Medo-Persian empire ruled by Darius and Artaxerxes and different Persian kings. The Greek, uh, the, the leopard was Greece that was established by Alexander the Great and other Greek uh, Greek kings after that. And then the fourth beast with 10 horns was Rome, the mighty Roman empire ruled by the Caesars, ruled by people like Nero and Diocletian and Constantine and uh, Caesar Augustus. So we're dealing with real history, not mythology here. So you've got Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. Beasts represent nations, mighty kingdoms. So when you get to Revelation 13, and John says, I beheld another beast, uh, in the context of Daniel 7, this means John saw another mighty nation rising up into power. I, I spend sometimes a whole hour studying just this one verse with people, but obviously we don't have that kind of time. But uh, he saw another beast, another nation. It was coming up. The Greek word for coming up means growing up gradually like a plant in a garden. I'm a gardener, so I can relate to that. And he comes up out of the earth, which prophecy uh, indicates represents an area where there's not a lot of people, more of a sparsely populated territory on the earth. And he comes up down near the end times because at the end of this chapter, he's he gets entangled in enforcing the mark of the beast, which is still ahead of us. So he comes up down near the end times. He has two horns, and these two horns do not have any crowns on them. There's a a first beast in chapter 13 that comes up from the sea. He has 10 horns and he has 10 crowns. And crowns represent kingly power. So this beast has two horns without crowns, which indicates that the government of this nation is not going to be ruled by a king. It's not like uh, England with, you know, Prince Charles. It's not going to, it's not going to like Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nero, king of Rome. Uh, Charlemagne, king, you know, in, in Europe, out of France, Germany's had its kings, England has its kings, but this beast has no crowns, so which means it's going to be more democratic. It's going to be more of the people, by the people, for the people. It's a different kind of, of organization uh, and government. And it has two horns like a lamb. And the lamb in the New Testament is a symbol of Christ and his sacrifice. So this beast is not Jesus, but he has lamb-like or Christian 
features. And so uh, if you ask yourself, what mighty nation has been growing up gradually like a plan out of a wilderness area down near the end of times that has a division of power, two horns, without crowns, it's not a kingly power, no, it's more democratic, and that's Christian in, in uh, character in many ways, some ways, it would have lamb-like characteristics, but then it says he would finally speak as a dragon, which means that the lamb-like principles will will uh, will decline, and the dragon will speak. Force will be used, uh, and that's what will happen ultimately in the final hours of history. And Dave, I believe that that there is no nation on earth today that fits every single prophetic detail of Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, like America. And as I look at America, I look at politics, I look at the, the forces within this country, I see a battle between the lamb and the, and the dragon. I see the struggle between good and evil right in our country. And uh, prophecy predicts that eventually the dragon will speak in America and it won't be pretty. But the good news is that Jesus is going to return and the lamb will conquer the dragon. And well, that's where again we get to the end of the book, the back of the book, and we know that God will win in the battle between good and evil. Well, there's a lot of nations, a lot of countries right now, depending on the U.S., to start changing things, to, to push against this evil, and to stop all this political and warlike talk and, and, and things going on. I mean, even the people in the U.K., uh, they're begging us, you know, please do something. Please lead the way, uh, you know, against this battle against evil. And I, I want to mention, I, I studied a little bit about George Washington, our first president. Well, he wasn't actually our first president. There was another guy that was a that was a first president, but George Washington was the main guy. He was he was visited by angels a couple of different times, and uh, it talks about that. And uh, and he was actually on a horse, and he was riding, and he was shot seven times, but it only hit his coat. It never hit him in battle. Mm -hmm. And he was protected by these angels that would visit him. There was one guy, uh, he, was a, he actually was a reporter, that watched George Washington talk to something that was glowing, and it was an angel. It was outside of his tent. It, it was, uh, I think it was, uh, the uh, what battle was it? Uh, it was against the the... German soldiers, I think they were going to go, go to battle with because they were in cahoots with with uh, England at the time, and so he was praying and he wanted and they said, "Take your people and you will win, and this will be a great country." They said, "Have faith and trust in what we're telling you," and mm -hmm. and all those prophecies, whatever the angels were telling him, came true, and I guess that's a you know. A, beginning of our country we're talking about america yeah that's found. right and i have no dave i have no I, I have no doubt that god's providence has been over the history of america there's many many stories like you mentioned george washington who miraculously survived uh bullets and battles and you just look at the history of our country and how great we've become and how we have coins that say in god we trust we sing God bless America, land of the free, home of the brave. Our history is, is filled with evidences of divine intervention. And I believe that America has a specific place in God's plan. Uh, this is the bastion of religious freedom. It is from America that missionaries and Christianity has gone around the world, uh, preaching the gospel, teaching the Bible, uh, we've been we've done a lot of good in spite of our our checkered you know we had we did do bad things too we're not a perfect nation we've had our dark our dark days and there's dark things that are going on now but if you look at the whole history it's very clear to me that God's hand has been on this country and I believe that we are the second beast of Revelation chapter 13 verse 11. We are the beast that comes up out of the earth that has two horns like a lamb and will and will eventually speak like a dragon. That's us. And that's why in my little book, The United States in Prophecy, I go into great detail showing there is no other nation that fits every specific detail of the prophecy. And it even says at the end of Revelation 13 that this nation will affect the global economy. It'll become a superpower 
and it will influence the world's economy. And we, we see that with the dollar. The dollar is the world's reserve currency in spite of uh, you know our debt, our $33 trillion debt, mm -hmm. which we're not going in the right direction when it comes to that. Our financial situation is, is not <laughs> what yeah. it should be. But still, the dollar is the number one currency in the world. And this is not without reason. God has blessed this country. He's raised up this country. A lot of Christians live in this country. A lot of goodness has come out of this country in spite of its problems. And I believe we're right there. And I don't believe John made it up. I don't believe he just, you know, he, in his fisherman mind, who is used to mending nets and, and catching fish on the Sea of Galilee, that he could have crafted in his head all these details in Revelation 13, verse 11. He simply says, I saw another beast. In his vision, God showed him the, the future and the rise of America. He did not make this up. This is a supernatural book. It's inspired by God. It's loaded with uh, spiritual power and information that we all need. Yeah, we, we have an interpretation, I guess, situation going on. That's why we have so many different religions. And here are the prophetic perspective. You said many Christians don't know this, but there are three major prophetic schools of interpretation now in conflict. Preterism, preterism, and uh, yeah, preterism, historicism, and futurism. Each of these schools views the pro prophecies of Daniel and Revelation differently. That's where we're having a lot of problems. Is is, is biblical interpretation? It's just like with me asking you questions. My interpretations may may be different than you're explaining them, you know, in detail to me. And I I I really appreciate that. I have one more question after this. Yeah, well, hold, 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 before your last question, let me just quickly let me just quickly clarify what you just read. That um, in my view, when you read the Book of Revelation, you can read it with uh, either one of three different pairs of glasses, and people put on one glasses, which is called preterism, which is not that popular, but it's out there. And preterism basically says when you read Revelation, it all happened in the time of John in the time of Nero. And then the, the other view is uh, the other classes is called futurism, which means that most of the book of Revelation is all coming in the future after we we disappear. But the third glasses, which I believe this is the correct view, is that uh, the book of Revelation takes you down through history and climaxes at states in Revelation 13. That's a historicist, a historical perspective. It's not all in the past. It's not all in the future. It's going down through history, and America has a part in history and in prophecy. Mm -hmm. And now, we're, we, we're seeing competing views, and that's why a lot of people don't see American prophecies, because they think it's all in the past or it's all in the future, and they're not looking for what's happening right now. Right. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question, what's going on right now. We have, like, in 550 AD, if I got that date right, Muhammad, he he went to heaven. And, of course, he, he they wrote the Quran, the Muslims. My question to you, Pastor Steve, is will the Muslims and Christians ever get along? Can we really have some peace between the two of us and what's going on right now? Yeah, that's a big question. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, and I've got some of this in my next book that's coming out shortly in September called The Light at the End. There's a section on the dreams that God is giving to Muslims in these Muslim countries. There are many, many Muslims who are having dreams, and they're seeing Jesus in their dreams. Like there's one story about a Muslim man in a, in a village, and he had a dream of, of uh, Jesus he was glowing who came to him and was telling him to read the bible and this man was just overwhelmed by this dream of, of jesus and then finally he got up the courage to tell some of his other friends in the village the muslim village what he dreamed and he was shocked to discover that every single person he talked to they all had the same dream wow. and the whole village converted over to christianity now, you won't see this in the mainstream media, uh, but but these things are happening. So in answer to your question, will Christians and Muslims ever come together? Uh, th they won't come together if Islam stays as Islam, 
because there's a vast difference between the teachings of the Quran and the teachings of the Bible. But there are a lot of Muslims that are that God is giving dreams to them and showing them that Jesus really is the Son of God. He really is the answer. And they are uh, they're coming to Jesus, these Muslims. And so those Muslims who have their these dreams and their eyes open to Christ, there is hope. There they will be united with Christians. But the jihadists and those who believe that America is the great Satan and that uh, Christianity is a lie, uh, you know, there's not going to be any peace between the radical Muslims and Christians. But there is a coming together of sincere Muslims who God is reaching through dreams, bringing them to Jesus, and they are connecting with Christians. I, you know, we're talking about the U.S. and I have to. I'm I'm a veteran. I serve this country, but I I I love this country and this country. We do share a lot. I mean, we have every race, every nationality in this country. We have foods from all over the world on our, on on our city streets, and we actually cater to every race. and And we we try to be open, and we have been. We have, we're an open society to different races. And I I just told my wife that the other day. I said, I said we're not we're not racist here. Maybe some people have this idea. Uh, they might be. You know, there there could be some bad people. Yes, like we talked about. This country is is wide open, and we we allow the Muslims to you know have their their own religion. We allow people. We don't tell them what to do when they come here, but in in the return, we don't want them to tell us how to run our country either, do we? I mean, that's that's the part of the problem. I think uh, today a lot of people that come into this country, uh, they feel like they should have their own laws and have their own districts and and corners of the of the state or the cities. But that doesn't work because that's not you know assimilating you know to to our society, and I think that's part of the problem uh, we have today that that we should the Christians and somebody made a comment. I I heard this. They said the church is not doing enough to to have peace in this country. What do you say about that, Pastor Steve? You you, you think the church is actually helping to try to maintain peace? Well, when when you say the church, Churches, the church, religions. yeah, there's so many different yeah. churches that are out there, and so it's a it's a complicated scenario. the The principles of America have to do with, like it says, two horns like a lamb. America does have Christian roots. It also has roots in uh, the teachings of Jesus, where Jesus said in Matthew twenty two. He said, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And in that one statement, Matthew 22, verse 21, Jesus brilliantly separated the things of Caesar or government from the things of God have to do with religion. And the uh, the First Amendment of the United States Constitution that, that says Congress shall not make a law to establish religion or to prohibit the free exercise thereof, that principle is the principle of the Lamb. It goes back to Jesus. It denies the right of government to enforce religion or to prohibit the free exercise of religion. So America is based on Christian principles. It's based on uh, the Bible, but it also safeguards religious freedom and that it can't force people to be religious and it doesn't stop people from being religious, those who want to be. So there's the freedom that we have in this country. And, and Christians within this country, it's God's plan that they have an impact upon society, that they're the salt of the earth, the light of the world, that they uh, impact society for good. They stand up for moral principles. They believe in the Ten Commandments. They teach honesty, integrity, truthfulness, uh, you know, respect for authority, honor your father and mother, etc. And I think because Christianity is getting weaker in those areas, that many times its influence uh, is is counterproductive. When you have a, a lot of you know big ministries that uh, go down because their leaders are involved in nefarious activities, you mm -hmm. know this gives Christianity a bad name. And so. The, the battle is going on, Dave. That's that's really the bottom line. The battle between the lamb and the dragon, 
I believe God still has plans for this country. I believe that we still have two horns like a lamb. I believe the Christian principles are still somewhat intact, and we need to be doing the best we can to be a good influence on on society, and, and that's not happening everywhere. And it's unfortunate, but but there are still many good people that are doing good things in this country that care about people that are hurting and are involved in ministries and are being honest. And uh, and hopefully, you know, we have people in Washington D.C. that are of that tribe. Yeah. <laughs> we hope and we hope and pray. Right. I I know myself. I I I have my shows, and I try to enlighten people to the truth about a lot of different things. There are certain things that I can't talk about or I'll be kicked off the platform, you know, so you can't get too political. And I try not to. Uh, I, I don't like the political strife that we have uh, today. I, I reserve this question. My wife is a devout Christian. She's a great woman. And uh, I reserve this, this last question because this is something that's bothered me and gets me in trouble with my wife sometimes. We talked about Jesus earlier, and I said love, kindness. Uh, and forgiveness. There's one thing, Pastor Steve, that I have a problem with. Maybe you can explain it. Uh, that Christ, I have a hard time saying he's my Savior, because how could he forgive my sins 2,000 years ago when I haven't even made them yet? Do you have any light on that, Pastor Steve? Yeah, I, d I do. Uh, 2,000 years ago, he did not forgive your sins. 2,000 years ago, he paid the price for your sins and for the sins of the whole world. The Bible is very clear. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That's what the Bible calls the gospel. But then he rose from the dead. He went to heaven and he's now what's called our high priest up there in his heavenly temple. And that's where he gives forgiveness to people on earth who choose to respond to his love and to what he did on the cross and to give their lives to him, confess their sins and trust in him. So Jesus didn't forgive your sins 2000 years ago, but if you give your life to him today and say, Lord, I, I accept you as my Lord and I ask you to forgive me, he will forgive you today. And he forgave me uh, 45 years ago when I got on my knees and accepted him as my savior. Uh, and he forgives people all around the world and he's been forgiving people uh, all throughout history, but we have to do our part, and our part is we have to confess our sins and trust him as our Savior. And I don't, personally, I don't have a problem uh, calling Jesus my Savior because I know myself well enough to know that I need help in this world. I need God. I need a Savior. I need someone to forgive me and to give me the gift of eternal life because I I don't have those uh, you know, good things in myself. Naturally, I need help. And that's where humility comes in. Uh, you know, like I said, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And for me personally, when I accepted Jesus as my Savior and asked him to forgive my sins, it was it was fantastic. It was the, the beginning of putting my life back together, yeah. getting me out of drugs and the wildlife and the, you know, the addictions. And now, I'm a free man, and now I'm a, I'm a happy man, happily married uh, with my family, and God has blessed me, and Jesus is my Savior, and I appreciate him and his love and willingness to forgive even me. Hey, I was thinking of, the present, of that present day 2,000 years ago, but the way you put it, Jesus is still supernaturally with us. He's here with us. And he's that's right. still, still forgiving us. That's Correct. A, that's a good answer. I like that. I mean, it, it, it helps me a little bit to think about it a little more. And uh, it, it was complicated in my mind about how I thought about that, but I'm glad you explained it in, in a very eloquent manner. I like that. I, I I think we're about at the end of the show, about an hour and a half. So uh, Steve, uh, Steve Wahlberg, tell us what you're doing and where you're going to be at. You're going to be in D.C., I guess next couple of days, but tell us what your future plans are and where we can contact you. Yes. Well, I'm going to DC tomorrow for a recording on a show called Hope at Night, three, three recorded programs. But uh, in answer to your question, the main thing for people to get a hold of us, if they like what they've heard, if they want to learn more, 
Uh, our ministry is called White Horse Media. Our website is whitehorsemedia.com. Uh, we have a, if they go to YouTube and type in White Horse Media, we've got lots of videos about Bible prophecy and many different things. We have over 10 million views on our YouTube channel. We have a Bible school. They can go to whitehorsemediabibleschool.com. That's free. Uh, we also have what, what I'd like to do, Dave, if you don't mind, is sure. uh, our, we, we have people that support our ministry and they've given money to a book fund. And so we are going to offer some free books to your, your viewers. We're going to offer uh, Approaching Armageddon and End Time Delusions and the United States and Bible Prophecy for the first 10 callers that call our toll-free number, which is 878-BIBLE, 800-782-4253. If they call and say they heard uh, Dave and Steve on the Strange Reality Show, and they hope that they're one of the first 10 callers, then they'll get this for free. Uh, if they're out, if they're more than the first 10 callers, I think it's about 20 bucks, which includes shipping if they want to get these books. So we do sell these books, but we're giving them away for, uh, you know, for, for some of your callers. We've got supporters that have said, hey, we want to give away some free books when you get on these different shows and podcasts. So mm -hmm. Uh, whitehorsemedia.com is where we are, and we welcome people to go there, check us out, and we hope our ministry uh, helps a lot of people. I will put that in a narrative when I when I post this uh, tomorrow. Uh, this is a okay. recorded show, so I'll put it in tomorrow. So the first ten callers tomorrow night will will be the ones I guess you'll be looking looking at. I'll put that number in there, uh, you know, and and also your your websites. And it's been fantastic talking to you. It's been uplifting, you know, because the other shows I've had, they're all different and they're all, they're all good, but you come across with something that, you know, that I was, I've been trying to put pieces of the puzzle together and I always do. And this means a lot to me, just having you on the show, Pastor Steve Wahlberg. Thank you so much for being on the show. You've been listening to Dave Emmons and the strange reality. And I hope that you, You'd listen to this this program. It's a, it was a great show. It's uplifting. It's what we need today. Thank you, Pastor Steve Wahlberg and the White Horse Media. Thank you so much.